interesting thing is that Maury B. King has been at this a lot longer than Stanley Meyer ever was. He's been lecturing in this field for the last 40 years. Meanwhile, I want to just share a little anecdote. In the 1980s, I interviewed a German physicist by the name of Wolfgang Ludwig. Has anybody ever heard of Wolfgang? Not even one person. Oh. There he is, one person at the back has heard of Wolfgang Ludwig. Um, he did amazing work in the field of physics, working with energy and healing devices. But when he was a kid, his thesis work was done on the memory of water. And as we know, <clears throat> that's the basis for homeopathy and any number of other technologies and what is going to be introduced in just a moment here. And he was saying that water could carry information by rearranging the clustering structure of its molecules in response to an energetic input. More recently, Masaru Emoto popularized this phenomenon in photographing beautiful snowflake shapes along with other geometry in response to emotional input into water. Today we learn that water, when subjected, when subjected to high voltage discharge, can produce another kind of geometric shape, a torus-shaped plasmoid, which can amazingly produce enough force to drive a piston. According to our next speaker, Maury B. King, even hobbyists can now make this water cluster gas, and this gas can run a generator. It's out there. Anybody can do it. What does this mean for the future of our technology? Well, Maury's going to tell us, and he's already told us in some of his books, tapping the zero-point energy, quest for zero-point energy, the energy machine of T. Henry Moray. So let's welcome one of the pioneers in this field, Maury B. King. Uh, I want to thank the staff for inviting me back to give, give a presentation. Uh, unlimited energy right in front of our noses. Can, can you believe it? I didn't. I, uh, I was a graduate student in electrical engineering, systems engineering. Uh, my professors were, were uh, I was friendly with them. They were quite proud of the way I worked. And then something abruptly happened. And I fell from the graces, the loft towers of academia down into the pit of Kukdom. And what happened to me it was, it was something I read. Back when we had the oil crisis of 1974, I looked out of my window at my apartment in Philadelphia and I saw the lines of cars to get gasoline. And just then my roommate, who happened to be a student of general relativity, asked, have you seen this? He brought me the big book by Meisner, Thorne, and Wheeler, Gravitation. And the last two chapters of the book were Wheeler's theories of geometric dynamics. It talked about virtually limitless energy embedded in the fabric of space, fluctuating at a very, very high rate with incredible energy densities. It was called the zero point energy or the zero point fluctuations. And I asked the question can this become an energy source? So I went to my physics, um, I went to my engineering professors, and they said, never heard of it. None of the engineering professors have heard of it. In fact, most of the engineers have not heard of it. It's not in their textbook. And yet the physicists have discovered it. They work with it. And what I found is that we actually have it in our science. It's in our physics. And the engineers just don't know about it. So all we have to do is just learn what's actually there. So we can explain how to tap limitless energy from the zero point energy. And we can get it using water of all things. The simplest experiment, and the key to a simple experiment is to have massive replication. And by the time I'm done, you're going to see how to explain it with the standard theories of physics and see how simple the nature of the experiment is. And it's effectively cavitating the water in the popular electrolyzers. What's in common between a car that appears to run on water and an inert gas engine. It is this. <laughs> Excuse me. An archetype form, a micron sized torus form. We're going to see this four times appearing in this talk twice in water and twice in plasma. And when it appears in plasma, uh, it makes vortex rings called plasmoids. It's like a slinky closing on itself. And they, uh, they uh, 
manifest the nautilus force and the nautilus energy, and it can occur in water gas clusters and inert gas clusters, and we can make it from the co collapsing cavitation bubbles. The main ideas are the zero plane energy really exists, self organization can occur. It, when it does occur, it interacts with plasmids, tends to make these vortex rings called plasmoids. They exhibit both anomalous force and anomalous energy. They can cascade to produce larger ones. They can, you can take an energetic matter torus and with an abrupt electrical discharge convert them to plasmoids with, with a high voltage pulse. And they can cluster, clusters can form in both inert gas and in water. With this up, offers an opportunity to convert something extremely inefficient, the internal combustion engine, where you inject air and, water and fuel, you ignite the fuel, the hot air causes the piston to expand, and you waste most of your energy as heat. You're typically 20, 25% efficient. However, if we inject these energetic clusters in the, into the internal combustion engine, give them a very abrupt voltage pulse, typically from a discharge capacitor, they, uh, they make the plasmoid, they exhibit mutual repulsion, they exhibit anomalous force, and they drive the piston with a huge amount of energy, much greater than you would ex expect, and effectively we're getting it from the zero point energy. It allows us to retrofit automobiles. That's the big advantage. We can work with the technology to that. Every few years or so, there's someone claiming they have a car that runs on water. Uh, I like the one coming out of Pakistan. Uh, the physics professors jumped all over it. It violates the laws of thermodynamics, but I just love what the reporter said in response. Why all the whining about violating the laws of thermodynamics? What law in Pakistan has not been violated? <laughs> We've got to bring that reporter as one of our prime speakers. <laughs> uh, you just watched the Denny Klein video earlier. It showed. Uh, I like to show that because it showed Brown's gas and, and the anomalies of Brown's gas, but because we're short of time, we just have to keep moving. Uh, very popular projects, these uh, water electrolyzers, they're typically used as boosters. If you go to YouTube, uh, just put in water fuel in the search engine, you find over half a million videos now. Uh, HHO games, very popular in Florida. They gather together in their big tent and the hobbyists show off what they have. Uh, typically, the, the dry cells, they separate the plates by gaskets, very typical. The Anton cell, we'll see later, is a very good cell, very, very tight gap. We'll see why that's important. Uh, you can also feed the water in from the bottom. We'll see why that's important. Uh, Sterling Allen made the summary video. The important thing about this video is the website. I, every PowerPoint, every presentation I've given on this topic, including this talk, is available for download right now from this website. So you don't have to take notes, you'll get every slide. And uh, all you have to do to get to this website is Google Water Fuel ZPE. ZPE stands for Zero Point Energy. Uh, the names of the gas, this comes from the electrolyzer, Brown's gas, HHO is a popular name, meaning atomic hydrogen and oxygen. It's what Yul Brown thought it was because he was trying to explain why the gas was so energetic. Uh, hydroxy is a popular name and the correct name in chemistry is oxyhydrogen. But there's a secondary gas, that's the theme of this talk, and it's basically coming from a charged water gas cluster, George Weissman calls it electrically expanded water, he's the one that discovered it first. Omasa gas, he, he's the furthest ahead on the proper protocol for making it, and certain Gourley recognized there's another gas there, that, so they named it after themselves, SG gas. Nearly everyone out on the web, nearly everyone, believes the energy is coming from hydrogen. But electrolysis cannot yield excess energy. It costs you more energy to break apart the water molecule than you ever get back by burning the hydrogen. So it basically violates thermodynamics. That path has actually lost the energy. In fact, in these electrolyzers, you really don't want hydrogen. You want something better. So what's the energy source? Well, we're going to see it's the zero point energy. Uh, the zero point energy, back, back in the 1700s, 1800s, uh, the scientific community believed uh, space was filled with this ether and then the Earth would move relative to it. And it was a very simplistic model. It looked like it was static. And so when they did the Michelson and Morley experiment, they said, gee, if the Earth's going to move relative to it, we would see the ether win. They didn't see it. It only ruled out one type of ether model. That's the static ether model. They didn't even rule out the drag model, where the ether gets dragged along. So the modern view 
of the, vac of the vacuum energy and essentially the ether is fluctuations of electromagnetic field energy. Uh, it gives rise to the uncertainty principle, this underlying jitter to everything in quantum mechanics, and it gives rise to pair production. Electron-positron pairs can spontaneously uh, be created from the vacuum, and then they instantly go away. Create, go away, create in this big turbulence. Uh, it's well discussed in the standard physics literature. This is a physical review, a conservative journal. It's considered the most prestigious journal in the United States, and they discuss zero-point energy in the journal. Uh, it can explain why all the quantum effects arise, why the hydrogen atom is stable. It can actually become an energy source without violating thermodynamics. That's a very important paper by put off. Uh, it can give rise to gravity and inertia. It contro controls inertia. That means the fields coming from the zero-point energy can allow a system, a propulsion mechanism to drag uh, whatever is caught in the field as if it, as if it didn't have any mass i.e. a flying saucer type propulsion where you can abruptly undergo hairpin turns without feeling distress, distress from acceleration. So therefore, our physics actually has embedded in it the, the underlying principles to, to do flying saucer propulsion. <laughs> My poor professors are rolling in their grave. <laughs> so the, uh, it's called the quantum fall. This is what they call this turbulence. Electrical flux enters and leaves our three-dimensional space in this chaotic fashion, it's more like a plasma, a turbulent plasma. These tiny holes where the flux enters are down at the Planck length, 10 to the minus 33rd centimeters. That's 20 orders of magnitude smaller than the elementary particles. Can self-organization occur in this? At first, the answer would be, no, that's chaos, that's random. Everything decays to randomness. How can that occur? Well, self-organization self can occur under certain circumstances. In fact, Ilya Prigogine won the Nobel Prize in 1977 for identifying the circumstances under which a system may evolve from chaos to self-organization. And the system had to re require three characteristics. It had to be nonlinear, far from equilibrium, and have an energy flux through it. And it turns out the zero-point energy does fulfill these characteristics under certain circumstances. In fact, the energy flux itself comes from a higher dimensional space. Imagine this line called the slot called flatland slot is a plane and, the inner, and that's our three-dimensional space. By the way, this comes from brain theory now. They all jumped on board, which is the derivation of string theory. And the word brain means membrane. Uh, the, our three-dimensional space is just one of the many parallel universes. This activity is orthogonal to our three-dimensional space. That's why it appears things pop in and go away, pop in and go away. They're coming from a higher dimension. When the energy passes through, it's incoherent fluctuations, that's the background vacuum fluctuations. Uh, when there's a slight tilt to it as it comes through, we call it a polarized vacuum. And when there's vorticity to it, it undergoes, uh, makes the elementary particles. It's as if this flux is the flow of the river, and the vortex is, uh, I mean, the is like the whirlpool. So the flow of the river maintains the whirlpool. We see the whirlpool as an elementary particle. And uh, thus, it is the zero-point energy flux gives rise to every elementary particle. That means it gives rise to all of existence. Uh, other folks have jumped in on it. Brian Greene has written popular books on, on the nature of multi-dimension universes and the parallel brains. And uh, The Hidden Reality is, is dedicated to that. And the physicists take this stuff seriously. The engineers think they're off their rockers. They don't believe it. I like Lisa Randall's book. She's a Harvard professor, and she talks about uh, some of the problems they have in physics with the standard model and the other, and the other things. She's willing to air their, their issues, and all their issues come from the zero-point energy because it looks like we have an infinity embedded within. It's like we have an infinity embedded within a point, and what's really happening is there's just another dimension that's not part of our models. That's why it appears to be infinite, but if they model, start modeling the other dimension orthogonally, they'll make more coherent models. Uh, I like Robert Lockwood. He's a Nobel laureate. He is basically on the same idea. He says everything arises from collectives, self-organization from collectives, everything including the laws of physics themselves. And I really applaud it because that was the back, that's what's required to get self-organization to come from the vacuum to, to become both the elementary particles as well as a possible energy source. When we take that energy, into plasmoids. So basically, the, 
cohere the zero point energy, we work with Primogene's principles. We work with a highly nonlinear system like the plasma. We abruptly drive it far from equilibrium using an abrupt pulse. And we maximize the zero point energy using the ions as well as vortex forms. Now, typical electrons in a conductor are called the conduction band electrons. It's modeled as an electron cloud. And that electron cloud is essentially in thermodynamic equilibrium with the zero point energy. And thus, we don't see that in our normal circuits. That's why in typical electrical circuits, working with just electron conduction, do not manifest excess energy. However, the nucleus of, of an atom, especially in a plasma, exhibits a strong field lines of vacuum polarization converging to it. So abrupt motion of the nuclei, this is why abrupt discharge in a plasma will activate the zero point energy in a coherent way. So basically, if you have a surge, a very abrupt motion of ions, you can see how we bend that zero point energy flux into our space, and the component that's aligned with the plane manifests as extra voltage in the system. You seem to have more voltage than you should have, and thus that voltage can be used to um, extract energy. Uh, they see it in, in experiments, in the collision experiments with ions, they call it exotic vacuum states. And the plasmas in the ion acoustic mode means we're oscillating the ions at acoustical frequencies. They also exhibit uh, large energetic anomalies, excuse me. Runaway electrons, anomalous heating, and they typically take the form, they notice this in the, even in the fusion experiments, the hot fusion experiments, they take the form of some type of plasmoid, some type of uh, ball lightning shape, and then they associate that with the anomalies and the energy. So they're seeing it, they're seeing it in the plasma experiments, they just can't say, oh my gosh, I'm getting extra energy. They'd be banished. <laughs> they then they'd be joining us. <laughs> Uh, it's a force-free vortex. It's like a slinky closing on itself. It naturally stabilizes there, as long as you have symmetry to launch it. Uh, the plasmoids cohere in the form of an energetic torus. This is a common theme. You, you've seen this theme quite a bit. The Thrive video stressed this theme. A lot of people have had this vision that uh, the, the torus form is, is key to extracting energy. We see it, uh, Nassam Harriman uses the double torus form. And he shows how it can guide the flows on the planet or the sun. It, there's a, it's an archetype. It keeps reappearing over and over and over again. David Lapointe did the same thing. He makes these, uh, with bowl-shaped magnets, he's able to make these torus fields and show how they, may, in his plasma experiments, create the same shapes that we see out with the tele, Hubble telescope. And you see the same, the same shapes. He says these are the archetype form of guiding self-organization is the dual torus. Uh, here's a paper, if you like math, uh, it was sponsored by NASA. It was also speculating there might be a zero-point energy fluctuation coherence. Uh, basically, pair production is that these pairs spontaneously come out of the vacuum. That's an incredible self-organization event, right, to make these vortex rings, these micro elementary charges of that. And these two pairs are entangled, they're coupled to each other. And, ba and basically, this is just new this year, the physicists, uh, Maldacena and Suskind are suggesting entanglement can be modeled by a wormhole connecting the two pieces. And uh, a good analogy for this is the follicle soliton. So if you can imagine that the plane of, of a swimming pool is like our, it represents our flatland slot, it represents our three dimensional universe, there's these counter rotating uh, vortices that can be made just by scraping a frisbee across the plane and they're connected by a thin filament. And if you put an ink drop in one of the vortex, it goes in and outlines the filament. Uh, uh, Robert Kine uh, made a video, he really talks about it, the follicle soliton is a two-dimensional analogy to that. If we can play this video, please. Push this one. You have to push this one. Play button on the right. Play, play button on the right. Thank you. Where two separate things are actually coupled together. 
And that, that, that analogy is the point. That, that's how we get entanglement between electron-positron pairs. Even if they're separated in our, in our three-dimensional space, they're still connected in the higher dimensional space. And if we uh, connect in both directions, up and down, we, we, make, we can actually make a torus that's going orthogonal to the plane. And so the entire, thus we have a single entity that appears to be two separate things when looked at from our space, but are actually connected in the higher dimensional space. And this would be called the hypertorus. If you can play that video, this shows you how a hypertorus would rotate in a, in a higher dimensional space that when it's projected down the three space, we see it as an inside out type rotation, where it goes inside out. Can you, if, oh, we won't play it. Just trust me, it takes too long to, oh, okay. <laughs> He's getting better. <laughs> oh, it was some type of double rotation going on, and they, they kind of just use it math of, of quantum mechanics to explain it. But. In, in fact, you have to go to sophisticated models like this to actually explain what's going on, and the physics community hasn't quite caught up yet. But when they do, let's just call them a bunch of kooks. A <laughs> 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 turnabout's fair play. Right? So uh, basically, this higher dimensional flux is orthorotated by the toroid. By the hyper, it's a hyperspatial type of rotation, and that's why we get more energy just twisting into our space, and that's why these plasmoid forms yield excess energy. They're ortho-rotating. Right, ortho means at right angles. The energy. So thus, we can take any matter torus that, that's somewhat in the high energy state, give it an abrupt electrical pulse, and boom, we take it in the plasmoid, and at the moment it's converted to a plasmoid, it's ortho-rotating some of that zero-point energy. So the key is to make those torus. How uh, with the experimental evidence? Ken Schoeller is one of my heroes. He just passed away this year. Uh, he's worked with launching a very, a very simple experiment that launches a, a micron size uh, charge cluster or one of these plasmoids at a micron size. This is from the sharp point. Just give it a abrupt pulse from a capacitor. And uh, he'll launch one of those ball lightning-like entities. And when it hits a conductor, it makes a crater. Uh, what's happening microscopically this is a blow-up of the point. A liquid melt. The, the tip starts to undergo a liquid metal melt. There's a slight protuberance of liquid metal that goes into the ionized corona around the tip. And then the tip blows off, and the instant it blows off, you can see the circulation symmetrically just naturally makes a torus. Makes a circular flow that makes the vortex rings. That's how they launch the plasmoids. The trouble is, when you work with the solid tip, you'll wear the tip right off. So what Ken does, he made like a fountain pen. He replenishes the tip with liquid metal. So he feeds liquid metal into his launcher, so he doesn't destroy the tip, it just gets replenished each time. So he's able to repeatedly launch these uh, plasmoid forms. He called them electron volatum, uh, stands for Latin for strong charge, EV. Later on, when he was convinced he had excess energy from the zero point energy itself, he called them exotic vacuum objects, EVO. They contain about 100 billion electrons, 100,000 ions. Uh, the charge to mass ratio is always in the form of electron. It always seems to settle out at that particular value, no matter how big the entity is. It keeps hitting that charge to mass ratio. And they contain excessive energy. They can form up into chains in the, in the plasma environment around them. Uh, they can, he made positive ones. This is very important because it's not, it proves it's not a collection of positrons because when it hit a metal plate dissipate, he doesn't get the gamma rays that you expect from electron-positron annihilation. He's gotten to the essence of what makes charge itself from the vacuum. Uh, this this self-organized mold that ends up making, making charge from the clay of the vacuum fluctuations itself. I, I told him this is the most significant of the experimental finds because he's getting to the essence of self-organization from the vacuum itself. And once again, the charge to mass ratio is like the positron. He makes them in pairs, and they spiral around each other. When you hit the plate, they make a dual crater. Uh, he makes dark ones. They go dormant. And it looks like you can't see them anymore, but just another small pulse reactivates them. So we have energy storage in this high-energy high mode that can be reactivated to exhibit more, more energy. So that's, you're kind of in a matter cluster mode at that high-energy state, which can be reactivated. Keep that in mind when we talk about the water clusters. So basically, here are the anomalies. They like to have here to uh, dielectrics. They bore holes 
and high melting point ceramics. And here's the important point. When they do so, it's not from heat. It's like the, the, it's a coherent form of energy that makes the atomic bonds just let go, no matter, no matter how hot it does. Keep that in mind when we talk about the Brown's gas torch. Uh, even claims of element transmutation and radioactive reduction. And when we talk about Mark Leclerc's work later this afternoon, we're going to see the same claims. The same phenomena is occurring from plasmoids and from, and, and from what Mark Leclerc has discussed. So we have uh, clusters co coherently combined into a vortex or a vortex ring. Uh, they can cascade. Ken Shoulders discovered that. If he takes one EV and uses it to stimulate the next launcher down, he can make a bigger one. In fact, if he launch, lines up the launchers, he can make a centimeter size one coming, coming off the end. And he didn't like those. They were too big, too powerful. Whenever they hit a piece of metal in the, in the lab, the EMP that would come off of that would, would fry his equipment. He didn't want to touch the big ones. It was just too, just too dangerous. And by the way, this makes a perfect unipolar switch where, where you need to uh, get the energy to propagate down and not reflect back. Uh, his, his biggest energetic discovery is not really well known because he didn't publish it, but he shared it verbally with me. He says when he makes a vortex of water uh, through one of the boreholes, bore the hole's about 10 microns long, and he shoots one of these EV down through that vortex, there's such a coherent pulse of energy that comes through this, it damages anything, anything that it hits. He couldn't figure out a way to tap it. Um, he said it, the analogy is like shooting a, a bullet at a windmill blade. It would just go right through. However, we were brainstorming at the Tesla conference with, uh, with Jeff Hayes, and uh, he's a big proponent of the Tesla turbine. The Tesla turbine works on the principle of just shooting something through the gap, and the boundary layer makes it go. So maybe a Tesla turbine can, can tap shoulders, uh, EV water vortex. So that's kind of an exciting possibility. Uh, any type of larger plasma vortexes can co cohere the zero point energy. It's like we entrain the ether into a vortex form, a coherent form. Uh, they see it both in the laboratories and, of course, in nature as their tornadoes. Uh, means that tornadoes themselves, as well as lightning themselves, could cohere the zero point energy. They could be zero point energy activators. In fact, anytime you have any type of an abrupt plasma discharge, it's likely to have zero point energy activation. Uh, there's inventions made on this principle, these vortex engines, they make a big vortex and they ionize as much as they can. This is the most suppressed invention of all the inventions. They, they, these are flat, you hear about them and then boom, they're gone. Uh, energetic clusters can form in inert gases. Uh, this is the basis of the PAP engine. The rare earth, a uh, great experiment because they don't combine with anything, they, they, don't, they uh, don't combust. And yet, when you make a cluster, you hit them with a laser. They see this in the, in the standard literature. They exhibit this, exhibit, uh, this explosive impulse that comes from that. So they're puzzled by that. What's going on? And they show their structure to these clusters. So you make the clusters by uh, hitting it with, with a lot of voltage spikes. And that was the basis of the PAP engine. I recommend issue 51 of an energy magazine that completely dedicated to the PAP engine. Um, PAP had four patents, or three patents, on, on the engine, and, and uh, uh, Russ Grease will cover this later. Uh, basically, it had some radioactive material to keep the plasma ionized. It wasn't really the source of the energy. But notice when, when the chamber closes, when the, when the piston closes up, it's carved to make a large vortex ring. So he has these little clusters that are ionized, uh, the, the plasmoid clusters, and he cascades them to a large one, a very large one. And I think that's the key to really driving uh, the PAP engine. Uh, there's been replication attempts. Bob Rohner has presented at the Tesla conference. Uh, Daniel Roberts came in and he said, it's easier if we work with a, uh, like a turbine. We just have to hit them with the blaze. But I'm afraid when we make really good EVs being injected, we'll start to put craters on those blades. Uh, Russ Grease is here with us at the conference. And so he could be giving a presentation later, so I'll let him cover, cover this. But he started an open source project. Uh, I highly recommend his paper. That was an extraordinary uh, science and, and technologist. It just came out this year. It was a very thorough paper. Energetic clusters can form in water. The reason I like water, it's the easiest of experiments. It allows the garage guys to all do it. Everybody can play around with this idea. 
Uh, Peter Gnu had an extremely simple experiment. He's an MIT professor, and uh, he's given talks over this for years. This is from one of his talks. And he was able to photograph the plasma we found with high-speed photography coming from his chamber. His chamber was very simple, just a small water container. And uh, he would do the abrupt discharge from a capacitor. You know how much energy was on the capacitor. He'd throw the weight up in the air and see how high it goes. He says, well, I'm getting almost forced. And he mentioned, oh, I also blow out my bolts. And I said, you're blowing out the bolts? You didn't even measure that? Oh, well, that would be conservative. I said, oh my gosh, you didn't even get to where the real energy, where the real energy's at. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, Gary Johnson, Kansas State University professor, repeated the experiment, but then he designed it so his, his uh, chamber would blow apart, and then he made sp the spherical weight, it's a hollow chamber, and then when he did the discharge from the capacitor, they go flying up the guide wires, he could photograph how high they went up, and now he proved there's both an energy anomaly and a force anomaly. And he knows how much input energy he had on the capacitor, and the key thing on these experiments, that the discharge has to be very, very abrupt. If it's not abrupt enough, uh, you just get a normal discharge in water, nothing special happens. But there's a certain threshold that would be hit where, the, where all this activity happens. Uh, Harold Aspen's written about this for years, about the uh, enormous explosive effects from, from these pulse ion discharges in water. Uh, there is a website where they want to try to use that as a principle. Well, it's pretty tough if you're starting down at the water, at the ground state, and we're, we're, we're effectively in these big discharges, uh, making plasmoid in the chamber to, to blow it apart. Uh, Stan Meyer was using this as the basis of his final invention, was, was the injector plug. Uh, he's, there was basically a pulse plasmoid device. Uh, he would mix water, ionized air, and, and ran gas. Here's a, a copy of it. It's kind of like a little shower head. He put the three things in, and boop, he would give it a big spark, and it would have the anomalous force on the piston. That oh, was a complicated device because they had to pre-ionize the air with the laser. Uh, Brown's gas is even simpler still. So we're going to say Brown's gas is just not hydrogen oxygen, uh, but it's that secondary gas, electrically expanded water or charred water gas clusters. We want to see that the modeling fulfills both. Uh, it was a welding application that, that Yule Brown applied to Brown's gas. That's, that's where you notice the anomalies. The big anomaly is it's a very cool flame. You can quickly pass your hand through it without burning your hand. A little bit above the boiling point of water. Uh, it doesn't even boil water. Yet, it can vaporize tungsten. Look at that temperature, about 10,000 degrees. This was the big clue. It says not one welding torch can come up to the vaporization temperature of tungsten. And this little tiny Brown's gas torch that's hardly even hot can do it. It was, it, would, with, I, it told me everything. It, it was the key discovery. I said, holy cow, you got yourselves one of those EVs in there. You, you're making the same thing that Cone Scholars was making and observing the same thing. It causes the atoms just to let go. It's not heat that's doing the welding. It's a coherent effect coming from the plasmoids, these EV plasmoids. Uh, the anomalies pretty well can can uh, cut through anything, claims of element transmutation. We'll, we'll get into that when we get to Mark McClare's work. Uh, the biggie, the cool flame that can sublimate tungsten. Uh, it, it's not addressed in the scientific community, I just ignore this. this to me, it's incredible. Uh, George Weissman, I credit him for making a discovery called Electrically Expanded Water. He made the announcement in 1996. He said, uh, electric shock, uh, is observed when the water implodes spontaneously. He's not putting the engine, you just notice it in storage when it, when it implodes. He'll get electric shock, and there's some type of liquid crystal structure. He was surmising that. Uh, there's some, been some replication. Uh, Ron Mitchell replicated this. When you make the secondary gas, it manifests as fog. That's what you see. Most of the time, this is not happening in the electrolyzers. You get it, but when it's going really, really well, what uh, George Weissman observed in his transparent uh, electrolyzers, he says when it's going really well, there's lots and lots of turbulence going on and a lot of activity. And you start to see the fog coming off. And he thought, oh, I'm making a lot more hydrogen. But, but I think it's the other way around. It was the turbulence that caused the cavitation to make the secondary gas. And that's why you see a lot more coming off. It manifests as fog. When you see it coming off, fog coming off your electrolyzers, you know you're on track. Uh, the water gas is heavier than air. You can like fill a balloon. This is a garage guy experiment. 
stored a balloon for a day or so, uh, then away all the hydrogen. Balloons can't hold hydrogen very well, and it still exhibits the balloon torch experiment. George says, just uh, you know, fill a little water bottle with it and carefully turn it over and take the lid off and let the hydrogen have been away. And then when you spark it, you'll see an imploding ring go down. There's a heavier than air gas stored. That's the secondary gas. It leads to the action item for chemistry department. Create some brown gas, then away the hydrogen, study the residual gas. Does it burn? Does it still exhibit the brown gas torch anomalies? What is that gas? What is its structure? This is straight up chemistry departments. They pretty well have not looked at it except for one. That's Chris Ackman at Idaho State University. And what he did, he found out, gee, it's not diatomic hydrogen, not monotonic hydrogen. It appears to be ex gaseous water with the excess electrons. And he confirmed the low temperature of the flame and the vaporization of the, of the tungsten. So what we're going to find out, cavitation is the key to making that water gas. Question. Mark LeClaire contacted me uh, in 2011, and it was like a perfect fit. I did not know what the structure was, or what, what the structure was. It was his work that gave us the key. Uh, creates uh, microscopic craters, carves trenches, even transmuting of elements. Um, and, and it creates the, these water clusters, all from his experiment that manifests excess energy. He connected the dots. And this afternoon, we'll talk about his work and, and, and his discovery, because if his, his experimental work repeats, uh, we it will change the world, because it's so simple. Uh, we know about ultrasonics and sonoluminescence. This is a symmetrical bubble collapse. When we hit water with ultrasonics, typically mixed with some inert gas, the bubble collapses symmetrically, and we see a light getting em emitted. This bluish light, if it were thermal, would appear to be at a huge temperatures above 10,000 degrees. It would, it would it would look, people got excited, says if that's thermal, then we can use this for hot fusion. Now Julian Schwinger, a Nobel Prize winner, said no, that abrupt compression is cohering to zero point energy. So we got a, a Nobel laureate suggesting that in the model, and that abrupt correction is actually, co compression actually coheres to zero point energy and gives it off as light. So the good news is, well, we're getting some zero point energy cohered. The bad news is we're dissipating as light, and we're really not getting that much in this experiment. However, something happens when the bubble is near a surface or in irregularity. Instead of collapsing symmetrically, it starts to form into a torus. And going through the whole of the donut of the torus is the reentrant jet. And all the energy of that collapsing bubble goes to compress down into that reentrant jet. And there's extreme pressure. So we're going from a micron scale down to a nanometer scale. And under those extreme pressures, about 300,000 PSI, we form a solid state of water, a macroionic water crystal. And this was the discovery of Mark LeClaire, an expert on cavitation. And he says these carved trenches, and at the, at the tip of it is what he called a plasma bow shock wave. It's the active where he thinks the zero point energy coherence. And I says, my gosh. That is identical to Ken Shoulder's EVs. It, it like it cemented the deal. He, he made the same phenomena, it, phenomena, except using water. What could be simpler? And so there, there it is. We'll talk about it this afternoon. It manifests a self-acceleration. Ken Shoulder's observed this thing as well. It, if you let it keep running, it keeps accelerating, accelerating, accelerating. They see a propulsion effect going on. It's like this plasmoid is, is, is propelling itself. And, and building up extra energy. And that's how he gets to the transmutation. He has to let it build up its energy first before it strikes the surface to cause the nuclear reactions. Uh, here's a model. We'll talk about it that he drew. But basically, there's linear axes of water, of, of water molecules. It, it, the, in the solid state, the water molecule is actually uh, 180 degrees, degrees apart. It's not as traditional because we're, not, we're in a solid state form at this point. We're a water crystal. And Chris Ekman discovered a little bit of preliminary evidence of uh, linear water with excess electrons. That's what his discovery was. And he realized that would not be stable just as a lone molecule. It would have to participate in some type of cluster to be stable. And where that type of thing happens uh, is Rydberg matter. This is in the standard literature where uh, a number of uh, atoms participate together in a coherent structure where the electrons are way out of the deep orbitals. 
So the well, electrons are in a high energy state. Uh, the, these, this crystal can actually form in the loops. And these loops are stable under half a micron. And so this is basically the model. The electrically expanded water, we have the electrons out at the d orbitals. The hydrogen likes to hug it, hug it. Uh, the internal structure has the linear water closing into a loop. So everybody's model is fulfilled. You have the torus form. Um, you have the electrically expanded water. This can polarize. They've seen polarization chains. Uh, observe as, because it's, it's flexible. They observe these bubbles, but they like to hug each other. Uh, Andrea Pierharch talks about that. A lot of people thought they were hydrogen bubbles, right? But these are actually the water cluster bubbles. And thus, when you take one of those water crustal rings, hit it with a abrupt pulse, boom, we make the plasma. So many inventors have cavitated the water inadvertently. They didn't mean to. They just end up doing it. Uh, very typical is electrolysis gas in the narrow gaps. The electrodes have a rough surface. Uh, Paul Zagoras uh, made them extremely tight gaps. This is hard to do, under, under a millimeter. He roughened his plates just by uh, sandblasting. He said they're very important at that 45 degree angle makes a sharp lip crater on the plates. So he was the best at making plates. Could make it well, here's a picture of a sandblaster. And he would just pull water in from the bottom. He actually made a car to run on it, and it, out would come the gas. He just sucked the water in, out would come the gas from the electrolyzer. Another way to make turbulence is just blow air through it. Archie Blue did that. Didn't know why, right? But it makes the turbulence and it makes the cavitation. A mechanical vibration, as we pointed out, Amasa. He intentionally cavitates by jerking paddles, making jerk very fast. And he's able to run an engine with no air input at all. Uh, he's able to store the gas under pressure because it's not hydrogen. And he leaks, he allows the storage to leak away the hydrogen. And I highly recommend this video. Uh, the white gas smoke is uh, generated, so he sees the fog gas. Alas is the closest to having a consistent protocol to generate this gas. Uh, oscillating fields. Uh, exogen technology was uh, lead engineer Stefan Barry Chambers. Stefan Barry Chambers' sister was Marilyn Chambers, who happened to be the wife of Stan Myers. So after Stan died, she took all the plans to her brother. He found an exogen. He has three patents. They're all the same. And what's unusual about his patent? He did one thing unusual. He puts a toroidal coil under the water. Now, who in the right mind does that? Why would you put an electrical component under the water? But to make a long story short, that an oscillating toroidal coil will make an oscillating electric field around it. And if you have charged water, water clusters, they'll oscillate with it. And in that oscillation, they'll create the turbulence, which creates the cavitation. Just do it straight up with ultrasonics. Interesting web article here that says not only do you use an ultrasonic transducer, but use some zinc oxide crystals because that piezoelectrical generates some voltage for you that helps emit a burnable gas that they think is hydrogen. And this came from the University of Wisconsin a couple years ago that they just some of these piezoelectric crystals in ultrasonic stimulation. So this is a good idea to make that gas. And one, another improvement is just to sputter the water to be electrolyzed. You can both cavitate it, cavitate it and charge it by electrostatic rubbing. This work comes from Provincelet, Bubbles and Steam Electricity. And basically what he describes is thundercloud dynamics. We're mimicking thundercloud dynamics or the dynamics of a, of, of a Van de Graaff generator. Same type of dynamics. So we distill water acts as a dielectric belt and the rough conductive plates act as the cone. So basically, uh, we can start trying these means of cavitating the water. A sputter of the water across the bottom of the electrolyzer. I use a cavitating pump to feed, circulate the water to the electrolyzers to make a lot more of the clusters. Uh, let, the, let the plates vibrate themselves. It's called reed cavitation, like the reeds of harmonica. And that would help cavitate the water, Just get circulation and vibrate your apparatus. And so the goal is to use these principles to make a self-funding system. Self-running system, basically you run a gen set. You let the output from your generator drive the electronics, to drive the electrolyzer. Two teams of plain success. Uh, there are ways to cheat. You can hide alcohol, any hydrocarbons, so you have to make sure you're not cheating. So if you do it yourself, you know you're not cheating. Um, there's chemical reactions that can, that can work with hydrogen because they wanted to go open source. They weren't looking for money. I, I, I like 
I recommend these studying their work because I think these guys were honest. Steve, uh, Steve Eaton made an announcement in 2010 and self ran with the generator, the Troy Belt generator, and he had some power left over to light the bulbs. Uh, here's his device, very narrow gap, 137th of an inch. He used a spiral line to cause the water to and glass to sputter up like a barbershop hole. Uh, he found he had a big one. He didn't know about circulation, so he had to make a large one to get the overunity effect. Oliver and Valentine worked with a very poor generator. This thing might only be 15% efficient. And uh, they worked with a very good cell with uh, fragile gaskets that, that could vibrate. And that cell uh, is, is, I think, the trick of why they were successful. And they made a, they rode on an elevator for about eight minutes in a closed loop fashion. So, and Stephen Hartman made a really fun video that we'll show at the very end, um, you spicing in the Apple commercial because they think, they, oh, voila, well, they made the breakthrough and they're trying to share it with the world. So I'm wrapping up. Zero point energy exists. It can be a self, uh, it can become an energy source when self organization occurs, forms the plasmoids. And if you make vortexes of them, you even get more energy coherent. Uh, cavitation makes the reentrant jet, which makes the water crystal that conform into the ring. And then the charged water gas cluster uh, looks like fog. We make the plasmoid. And when we have the plasmoids in the internal combustion engine, we make a huge anomalous force that taps the zero point energy. Now our action items, chemistry department, make the Brown's gas, remove the hydrogen, what the heck is left? And inventors make a self looping system, and then share your information with the world so others can do likewise, because together we will make a new world. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. A couple, a couple of I've got the cover story of the December issue of Infinite Energy Magazine. Uh, the books are out there on the table. And this is the website where you can download all the information, every PowerPoint presentation, including this presentation. Just Google water, fuel, ZPE. Thanks again. Yeah. <laughs>20 years ago, we started finding when you move the water, weird things happen that made it way, way more efficient. Um, have they, from what you said here, have they got that down to not quite a science yet where they can get that, like you're saying, the fog every time? Because when we were looking at stuff, we found that maybe 15% of it would be what we called the water gas. It was basically a new form of water, but it would, the rest would be hydrogen and oxygen. With this way, are they getting it like, what percentage of it now is that stuff that isn't hydrogen or oxygen now? What are they able to get up to? Uh, uh, excellent point. Uh, ba basically, we, want, we don't want to make hydrogen, so what you want to do is cut back the current. Hydrogen proportional to current. You just want high voltage stimulation. So you want to minimize your electrolyte, right? Maximize uh, your turbulence. Maximize and, and, and then and maximize your cavitation. Um, why don't we go ahead and show this quick film and then we'll pick up the quick Q&A, okay. okay? We know about uh, cavitation with ultrasonic. You also mentioned um, you can create cavitation with uh, vibration on the, on the, on the plates um, of a fuel cell. Yeah? Can you? Okay, that's your question. No, no, is, can, can you use, um, can you use audio, audible frequencies to vibrate the plates and and cause cavitation. Sure. Yeah. I think you get a little more ultrasonics, but yes, you can, it can definitely. Okay. In fact, I think it happens at all all different frequencies. The idea is to get the plates uh, to move together. Okay. Cool.
Yeah, she has she has the microphone. <laughs> you were uh, state, uh, stating that the particular motor they were using that ran for eight minutes uh, was a very low efficiency motor, like you're getting fifteen percent efficiency. What about using a higher efficiency motor? Well, uh, like Steve Eaton. <laughs> Ah, well, they were working on a very low budget. That, that's, these are like a garage guy hobbyists. In fact, they went to all that trouble to jerry rig the timing. And you just saw in the video. That was, that was a, lot of, a lot of trouble. And I, 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 I personally wouldn't recommend spending a little more money. You're also saying that those high energy, like water bullets, I was not, I'm kind of new to this, but it's kind of water bullets. They said they work better on a turbine, and, but that will tear up the turbine blades. What about magnetic turbine blades? Right. This is a Tesla turbine that doesn't have blades. That's, that was a big thing about the Tesla turbine. Yeah, boundary layers. Good point. I don't actually need the light. I can probably just speak up. Um, you, were creating, you mentioned somebody who was creating rough surfaces on their face. You said the stopology. I don't remember who it was, but they said that 45 degrees angle of inclination was important when creating the surface topology. Can you elucidate on why, or do you have any ideas on why? Yes. Uh, would make with the craters from the strikes from the from the silicon carbide. This is microscopically. Would end up having very sharp lips on the crater. And when you see cavitating pumps like Griggs does in this patent, he stresses the importance of the sharp lips on the edge of the holes on the regularities. And Zagoras just lucked into discovering it. Thank you. Oh, another question, Jason. When you're making the uh, HHO gas, and you're getting this uh, fog coming out of you, describing what makes you think that that's not just steam from heat coming through? Yeah, well, we'll, ha we'll have to find out what's the temperature of it. Uh, um, what, um, on the video of uh, who replicated it, said it was very cool. It was a very cool fog to the touch. So uh, we, we, that that's, could be an indication it's not steam. Um, I have a question about um, the longitudinal or the, um, the Empyrean forces when you have a spark gap that was launching a weight into the air in one of the presentations. So this thing on Empyrean forces and closed loop systems, if you do a high um, current discharge into an electrode that has another electrode on top, as in a closed loop system, you observe a lot more matter uh, force, from Newt uh, Newton's of force, than what Maxwell equations allow for. So I'm curious. Uh, with producing hydrogen, is there ways to control that to make the ortho and para hydrogens more efficiently so then you get the exact burn you wish? Like how to actually change the molecules either through electrostatic or electromagnetic uh, interferences, like filters going through there? Okay, to interpret the question, uh, I'll answer by saying the point of the presentation is we don't want hydrogen. Either ortho or power. By the way, ortho and power are very close in its enthalpy. Uh, the ortho is a little more. Three fourths of normal hydrogen is ortho, and then one fourth is para. What's the name of the dipole? Which direction of changing the dipole? On the electrodes themselves? Yes. Uh, Grinnell's experiment is just straight across, just pretty simple geometry. Hey, thanks for being here. Um, really enjoyed it. The, um, if I ran moist air through a 25 kV spark gap, with this click, 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 click. What would I get? Well, uh, lightning. <laughs> really? I mean, if you ran that into a car engine, is it going to start getting 90 miles per gallon or what? I, I think it'll require a little more than that. Uh, we, need, we need to get this cluster form. That's, that's my opinion, coming from the cavitation. So, so vortex. So if you got, got an ultrasonic electron. transducer and we've got some of the, these cluster forms and then start sparking that, I, uh, that, that fog that comes off it might, it might uh, get us there. So, you know, I'd love to see that as an experiment because it would simplify things all the more. We could get, we could get the electrical stimulation out of making uh, the, the gas and just say it's coming straight from the fog, uh, from the cavitation fog. But we still might need some electrical input because we're polarizing and we're getting, we're getting the charge to separate on the cluster itself. So it's not clear yeah, nobody's really tried experiments along the lines that, I, that I've been suggesting because it, they all say, no, it's hydrogen. You're not going to tell me any different, and that's how far I get. <laughs> I was under the impression that if you start doing cavitation of aluminum, that you would get transmutation of many, many elements across the periodic uh, table, including the ones above 90, 
which could be radioactive, and if you start playing those games, you could make yourself sick with radioactivity. You didn't touch on that at all that I heard about, or did I miss it? You didn't miss it. It's happening at 4.30. Oh. Mark LeClaire, the inventor. <laughs> Tune in at 4.30. 10, 10 2. I think we have time for just one more question. Anybody? I was wondering if you, um, if, if there was a common frequency that was noticed, or if there were um, common patterns that were noticed at the moment of cavitation. Um, I would suspect it would have something to do with multiples of gold ratio. Okay. I, I can adjust. I can adjust. I can address the frequency question. Basically, what uh, Zagoras got 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 the right idea. Uh, we're, we're running these things, the kilohertz frequency is very typical in the kilohertz bands with pulsing. And everybody's thinking, oh, that's, what's, that's the resonance of the water molecule itself. It's not. Water molecule's up there at the terahertz band. But at those frequencies, that's, those are very good frequencies for cavitating. And so what they're doing is they're making the entire apparatus mechanically vibrate at those frequencies. And when you have water and gas coming off and everything else, that characteristic frequency tends to change. And what Zagoras did in his, in his electronics, he would keep following, changing his stimulation frequency to match the mechanical resonance of the whole system. And thus, we do have a resonance, but it's not just of the simple water molecule. It's of the entire apparatus. All right, thank you. I think that's it. We're out of time, so let's give a big hand. Four thirty for part two. We'll, we'll drill deep. And you'll be available for more questions. Everybody here presenting is making themselves very available for questions, so don't hesitate to come up to Maury outside at the table too. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.